Morning, everybody. It's Dr. Dillard once again. It is Tuesday. It is week nine. It is the spring of 2020, and we are continuing our discussion of the prostate. Specifically, we were talking about benign prosthetic hyperplasia a little bit. Let's keep digging into that. Let's really dig into that. Um, one of the so you shouldn't really call it. There's a controversy about whether it should be called hyperplasia or hypertrophy. It really should be called hyperplasia because the problem is too many cells in the prostate are being created. They tend to live too long as well. It's not a cancer or anything like that, but you shouldn't. Some people call it benign prosthetic hypertrophy, just meaning the Prostate is hypertrophic in size, but hyperplasia is the more correct term. I'm just going to call it BPH most of the time. But This is the most common benign neoplasm or tumor in men found anywhere in the body. Uh, a neoplasm, of course, is an abnormal mass of tissue, which results when cells divide more than they're supposed to. That's the hyperplasia, and you get more cells. And then they don't die when they're supposed to. It doesn't mean it's cancerous, though. Neoplasms can be benign, in situ. They, they never move. They just hang out. And maybe they even stop growing after a time. Cancer, of course, is just plastic cells that get into the, get into the pipes, right? They get into the bloodstream and get into the lymph system, and then they get into the brain and liver and anywhere else in the body. This usually doesn't happen. BPH is usually not cancerous. It results from a nodular hyperplasia. Remember, hyperplasia is an increased number of cells, which really likes the transitional zone. Remember, we talked about, let me see if I, we talked about the layers of the prostate last time. Uh, and the transitional zone, TT, is this one right here. It looks like a hot dog bun, and the prosthetic urethra here is wrapped around it. BPH loves to happen right here. It can happen other places. It can happen throughout the prostate, but it really likes that, uh, that region of uh, the transitional zone region more than anything else. Let's see, where did I leave off? Um, um, let's see, I'm lost. Um, yep, we did that one. Yep, mainly of the transitional zone. Tissue overgrowth then will compress the prosthetic urethra, as I showed you. And again, it's not a disease. It usually doesn't turn into cancer. It doesn't mean it can't. It doesn't mean you can't have cancer and BPH at the same time, but in and of itself, it doesn't become cancerous. What's the prevalence? Look at some of these prevalences. Prevalences, men over 40, between 40 and 60, once you get over 40, you got about 20% chance of having this to one degree. And just because you have it, by the way, doesn't always mean it's symptomatic. But once you get over 60, about 75% of men have it to some degree. That's a crazy number. I, we've never seen a number. I've never talked about a number that big before. Not even with atherosclerosis. So it's a huge number. Over 80, 86% of men over 80 have BPH. But again, the presence is not always related to, to clinical symptoms. In fact, only about 50% of men are symptomatic. So it doesn't have to start in that transition zone. It could start maybe in the peripheral zone, and your prostate could grow, yet it doesn't affect your urethra. So it doesn't always compress the urethra, but it sure does happen a lot. What are the symptoms? Well, again, it compresses, causes a beaver dam, right? If we make a beaver dam right here, pressure is going to back up upstream, and upstream leads to the urinary bladder. And so just almost like the heart, right? If you uh, have COPD, let's say, let's pretend this is the right heart. And you're pushing blood through the lungs, eventually it's gonna wear out the heart. 
And the same thing is here. It's going to wear out the detrusor muscle of the bladder, and that's not a good thing. All right, so the detrusor muscle has to contract really hard to get, to get urine through uh, this transitional zone, and it wears out. And it could even back up all the way into the kidneys, although that is more rare. So you can wreck your bladder with this thing. Uh, mitosis does not seem to speed up the condition. Epi uh, epithelial cells just seem to live longer. So that's one of the theories um, that some research shows that it's not a problem with sped up mitosis. Uh, it's so the cells aren't cranking out faster. The darn things are living longer. So apoptotic, apoptosis is broken, but not to the point like cancer cells are. But there's too many prostate cells around, and that's, uh, that's the problem. In order to understand BPH, we must understand normal growth. Okay, so we need to do a little bit of physiology here. Uh, so in order for the prostate to grow, and this is embryologically too, and in early adolescence and in older men, uh, the problem is DTH. But we'll see, is that really the problem? But I mean, ultimately is the problem. Too much DTH is being made and DTH is being converted and causing the transcription of growth factors, which is stimulating cell proliferation and this immortality somehow. And this this research here, uh, this is just research. This is from Robbins, so um, may not, in fact, be 100% true that mitosis, uh, maybe mitosis is sped up a little by the growth factors that are produced. So a little confused area there. But, yeah, so you got to have DTH. Dihydrotestosterone is the key here. Increased testosterone equals increased prostate growth. That is absolutely true. But it has to be testosterone within the prostate. Testosterone is first produced, of course, about the eighth week of gastrulation or of uh, gestation. Some of the testosterone is converted to DHT by an enzyme called, fortunately, you got to know this, type 2, because there's a type 1, type 2 5 alpha reductase. Because there's, there's alpha reductase inhibitors we have to talk about. Okay, um, This type 2 is the one that lives inside the prostate gland in the stroma of the prostate cells. Uh, and the DTH causes the growth of the prostate via the release of growth factors, as we'll see. Uh, further prostate growth occurs when you have a testosterone surge during puberty. So I guess what I'm saying here is testosterone is produced in vivo before you're even born, and that causes the prostate. Remember we said the prostate is almost pretty well developed by the time you're born, and it doesn't change much until your puberty hits. All right? But even in vivo, you still have testosterone production, uh, and that's and you still have type 2 5 alpha reductase in the prostate, and that that's what causes the growth then and now and when you're 60 or 70. So DTH also causes the increase of growth later on. So you can imagine when you get a big spurt of testosterone, the prostate is going to grow again. And we talked about how the prostate grows uh, up to about the age of 20 or so from puberty starts at 12 grows up to about the age of 20. All right, there's five, there's two isoforms of 5-alpha reductase. There's a type 1 and a type 2. Uh, the type 2 is exclusively found in the prosthetic stroma. Right, there's cells that, other than the secretory cells, which we talked about, there are cells that live in the stroma, and their job is to, amongst other things, is to secrete these the 5 alpha reductase, type 2 5 alpha reductase. So remember the stroma. These are, we talked a lot about these secretory cells here, making the prosthetic juice, which goes out into the prosthetic urethra. But there are cells hanging out in the stroma uh, as well. Uh, and these cells 
produce 5-alpha reductase, type 2 5-alpha reductase. There is another type 1 5-alpha reductase that is not made in the prostate. So this one's found mainly in liver and skin cells, especially in, in, in sebaceous glands specifically amongst the different cells. It's not made in carotenocytes, but sebaceous glands is probably the biggest producer. can also turn testosterone. Yeah, just like the other 5-alpha reductase, it does the same thing. It grabs testosterone and turns it into uh, DHT, right? Dehydrotestosterone. And the DHT, this is called extra prosthetic DHT. How does DHT actually cause prosthetic growth? Well, extra prosthetic testosterone, not. Um, yeah, or DHT, that can circulate around the blood as well. So extra prosthetic DHT or regular DHT made locally in the prostate, um, that gets into the cell mem or gets into the nucleus and flips on some, some genes, as we will see. Uh, but it has to be taken in, so we need to, uh, to understand this a little bit more deeply. Uh, it does... Again, for whatever reason, it, it favors the cells of the transitional zone. Are we getting into this now? I guess we're not getting into it yet. Uh, but what, yeah, we are getting into it. So, and I have a picture of this, but here is a prostate cell. And so we have DHT was made. Uh, DHT is able to get inside the cell, and then it binds with something called antigen receptor. And together, the two of them go into the nucleus of the cell to flip on genes. That's where we're going, the kind of the bottom line of this. Uh, but this tends to happen in the cells in the transitional zone more than anything else. All right, so once the DHT gets in the cytosol, it binds to something called antigen receptor. Robbins calls it nuclear antigen receptor, <clears throat> so watch out for that. But if you Google nuclear antigen receptor, there's nothing in PubMed. So I don't know. They're trying to make this word up, I guess. I don't know what the deal is with that. Everybody else just calls it antigen receptor. Next, this complex is carried into the cell nucleus, and then the DHT antigen receptor complex is able to bind to certain genes and turn them on and stimulate the transcription of certain mRNAs which code for growth factor. And the MRIs of the MRAs, the mRNAs of course are grabbed by a ribosome and they're transcribed into this growth factor. And the growth factor is the thing that somehow makes the cells live longer, which we don't understand. And it causes them to divide too fast. See, this is Robbins' is conflicting. I need to take that other slide out. Matter of fact, I will take that other slide out. So forget that other slide. It will be gone. I'm going to make a note so I don't forget. 82 conflict. Right, here's just a really swollen up prostate, right? See how it can get kind of nodular sometimes? Um, but that's the prosthetic urethra. You can barely squeeze a paper clip in, clip in there. So the guy was having horrible trouble urinating. Thing had to be removed. What about free testosterone? Can free testosterone get into the prostate cells and stimulate the making of growth factor? Not really. I mean, it can uh, but it doesn't do it very good. Testosterone's binding affinity to nuclear antigen receptor or the antigen receptor, it's not very good. So a little bit of testosterone can be directly uh, get into the nucleus and cause the stimulation of gene transcription for those growth factors, but it doesn't really do it very well. Not like dihydrotestosterone does. Um, the other thing I threw in there too, remember PSA levels can also rise in this condition. So those growth factors can have some strange effects. Here's kind of the overall scheme of things here. So here's testosterone floating around. 
testosterone can get in through the cell membrane, right? They're both hydrophobic, the cell membrane and testosterone. It's lipid, so it can go right through there, floating around in the, the cytosol here. Here's the nucleus of the cell. It's floating around. It soon bumps into a type 2 5-alpha reductase and is converted to DHT. The extra DHT that's made in other places in the body, remember DHT, extra prosthetic DHT, that can also get right in here and head right over in this pathway and bind with AR, the little receptor as well. Uh, so then it goes the same step, right? Um, yep. Yeah. So type 2 5 alpha reductase converts testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, which has high affinity for antigen receptor. And the pair of them go hand in hand, kind of like intrinsic factor in B12. Uh, they get phosphorylated, and there's some other steps, but the phosphorylation is important for getting it through the nuclear membrane. And once it gets into the nuclear membrane, it binds to a certain area. We won't worry about it, A-R-E, uh, but we won't worry about that. It binds to a certain area of uh, a gene on a certain chromosome. We won't worry about that. Bottom line, it makes an mRNA, uh, which codes, I mean, we, the, it really should have come out, right, the mRNA, and then it went to a ribosome, and then the ribosome actually transcribed the, the growth factor. Uh, but yeah, so the growth factors causes tissue proliferation, uh, immortality, PSA levels are not always, but sometimes increased, and yeah, there's in immortality or increased survival rate. Okay, so make sure you know that. Lots of I always ask questions about that. What else can cause the the benign prosthetic hyperplasia? Uh, well, it's believed the growth factors also affect the basal cells. Okay, so it could be basal cells. Uh, it could be the it could be the secretory cells that are affected. So it can be just about any cell in the prostate can be affected by these growth factors. Uh, the basal the basal cells uh, are particularly susceptible to this. Remember, they support the epithelial cells, and normally there's only a single layer of basal cells. And BPH, that's not true. Let's actually look at it. Remember we did this? Here's the secretory cells we talked about. They can proliferate as well. Uh, but the basal cells, normally a single layer of cigar-shaped cells. Remember we said this was weird uh, because there's no the basement membrane should be here. These cells should be, should be sitting on a basal membrane, but it's not the case. They're sitting on another layer of cells. Basal membrane um, is underneath that. But single layer, now look at in BPH. There's different types of it. So different types of basal cell hyperplasia. This is a normal setup. This is a kind of a lopsided, in this condition, you get those nodules throughout your prostate, like that picture we just looked at. Sometimes you get a more devastating type, uh, uh, but it's more uniform. You may not have the nodular appearance, uh, but there's just different types of basal cell hyperplasia uh, that can occur with this condition. All right, now we come to the great paradox, GATS theory. You gotta know, I do like the great paradox. So here's the great paradox, fact. Increased levels of prosthetic testosterone are thought to be a major cause of prostate cell hyperplasia. That's true, okay? You have increased, I say prosthetic, doesn't mean systemic testosterone. People, guys with BPH, when they take out their prostate and check it, um, there's too much testosterone in there. Fact, increasing age is directly related to the development of BPH. Yeah, we said that. Guy, the old folks are super, old men have a really bad problem with this. Fact, age is directly related to a decrease or increase age it should be inversely related, really, to, 
testosterone levels, but the way it reads, increased age is directly related to a decrease in testosterone. Okay, so the old, and we know that. You see that in the commercials and the radio uh, trying to scam you into buying stuff that's supposed to raise your testosterone. All right, so older patients with pH typically have low serum testosterone. But you see the, you see the paradox? How in the world, if, if people with BPH tend to have low serum testosterone, and we know that you have to have high testosterone in the prostate, what's the deal here? How can you have high prostate, high prosthetic testosterone, yet low serum testosterone? And for years and years and years, that has stumped, um, stumped the research community. How do we know that testosterone causes BPH? Maybe it's something else. Well, if you castrate a young boy, if they've had an accident and they've lost their testicles, right? They can never, they will never develop BPH, never. Um, so that's pretty darn strong proof that it is a problem with testosterone uh, because that's what the testos that's what the testes do, right? The main thing is to secrete testosterone. So the paradox, back to the paragraph. So as I said, if older men have decreased testosterone, why did they have such a high prevalence of BPH then? You think they would not have BPH because they don't have high testosterone. So that's the great paradox. And there's a bunch of theories, but this is the leading theory right now. So GAT figured it out. So hint, we didn't talk about this, but we have talked about venous system quite a bit and some of the smaller veins down there the all oh, the posterior and anterior tibial veins uh, they're they're about the same size as these testicular veins and sure enough testicular veins have valves in them because they're positioned against gravity and they're small and they need veins valves to help ratchet the blood out of here into the renal vein. We'll pick on the left testicular, but the right is the same deal. Okay, well, that's that's nice to know, but how could that, what's the problem with that? I mean, how can the work can that be related to testosterone and BPH? Well, remember, normally, where's the testosterone made? Down here in the lytic cells. Testosterone goes through this pampiniform plexus, which you learned in, uh, probably back in gross one, I can't remember when you learned it, but you learned it somewhere pan plexus, and its testosterone is ratcheted out, and it's dumped into the, the left renal vein, and then it's back and circulates throughout the body, right? Anybody see where I'm going yet with this? What's the problem? What if the valves become incompetent? And that's exactly what the theory is. So Gap published a paper uh, which discovered that by the age of 70, 75% 70 of men had incompetent testicular valves. They don't work anymore. Now you see where I'm going with this? So they had venous insufficiency of these testicular veins. So beaver dam, right? It's like a beaver dam. So the pressure's going to build up down here. Okay. Now, if you know your anatomy, you can see the problem. If you don't, we'll go over it. Right? So some regional anatomy. If we look down here, let's blow this up a little bit. Yeah, so here's the pampiniform plexus. All right, there's the testicular vein. But if you have a beaver dam right here, okay, pressure's going to build up. There is an escape route. There's two escape routes, but here's the major one. Uh, so the testosterone and venous blood can go into the differential vein and then it can pass through the vesicular vein some of it's still going to go up this way the vesicular vein but some of it's going to get forced into the vesicular plexus which is all the it's not just here i mean it surrounds the prostate so all this pure testosterone is going to be injected not all of it but a much higher quantity than normal is going to be injected right into the prostate. 
And that's a problem. And you might as well have super high levels of, of testosterone circulating through the body. You'd get the same effect. And that's the problem because of the venous insufficiency, because of this beaver dam here, because of the pressure, the testosterone path is rerouted. And a lot of it, the prostate gets hit with a lot more fresh testosterone than it's supposed to. That is the GAT theory. Got it? So with dunk dysfunctional testicular valves, everything I just said, uh, the, the blood backs up, the increased pressure uh, does two things. And this is also thought to be one of the causes of decreased testosterone in men because the the guys with venous insufficiency have destroyed lytic cells. So the the increased pressure destroys lytic cells as well. And it also, as I said, it reroutes the blood through this prosthetic venous system, as I just said. And now the, the prostate is fed way too much testosterone. All right. And once it gets in the inside the prostate and starts going into the cells that's converted into DHT uh, and then it's uh, via type 2 5-alpha reductase and that DHT is taken in binds with antigen receptor right just like we talked about binds with antigen receptor and it's taken right into the nucleus and and some growth factors are too many growth factors are made and you get BPH Okay, there's just a little drawing I just did. So most of the testosterone gets rerouted a little bit. See the light purple there? Some of the testosterone is still getting loose, but most of it's getting pumped right into the prostate. Are we good with that? It's really pretty simple. I don't think it's that hard. There are some other theories. It's not just the GAT theory. So another fact, fun fact about getting old. See, you guys, what you have... Uh, you have to look forward to. Uh, as guys get older, the testosterone levels decrease, and therefore the ratio between estrogen and testosterone increases. Right? Uh, and it's not because you're making more estrogen, uh, it's because you have less testosterone. So there is other research that demonstrates. And it's not Smith's research. There's a bunch of other research that demonstrates that higher levels, uh, a, a high estrogen to testosterone ratio, just like having too much estro estrogen around, it stimulates the synthesis of too much. The, it turns on genes that create too much, type 2, 5 alpha reductase. Well, if you have too much of that enzyme around, not, not a single molecule of testosterone will will escape being converted to DHT. Normally, not all the testosterone that gets into the prostate is converted because there's a limited amount of type 2 5 alpha reductase. But people with high estrogen have been found to have very high levels of type 2 5 alpha reductase, and therefore every smidgen of testosterone is converted into, into DHT. All right, and then you know the story. Once DHT is made, binds to antigen receptor, and uh, yeah, you know the story. There are some other theories. They're not as well supported. Uh, one, some studies show that people with BPH, elderly men, have increased sympathetic tone, and so that somehow is stimulating the proliferation of prostate cells. Not super well supported, but it's out there. Another one is that some kind of chronic inflammation occurs within the prostate, and it, the overproduction of cytokines and chemokines somehow turns on uh, the cell proliferation. Uh, not as much is known about that. Insulin resistance, there's some connection between insulin resistance uh, and metabolic syndrome. People with metabolic syndrome have insulin resistance, and they typically have BPH. They have a much higher level or chance of getting BPH than the general population. So those are some other problems, or I don't know if they're problems, but uh, what about risk factors? Genetics is still 
poorly understood about only about well about 50 percent of men under 60 who have undergone surgery have a relative with the disease so there looks like there's an autosomal dominant connection we think but it's not super strong because 50 percent of men don't have anybody with it uh, first degree male relatives uh, have it's thought to have a fourfold risk uh, so if you're if you're a dad you and you have BPH problems there's a fourfold risk that your male offspring will have it as well as what they think right now but it's a little shaky or there's uh, not super uh, super strong confirmation of that there are some risk factors. other ones global sympathetic tone we've talked about already heavy smoking seems to turn on sympathetics and they think that's related to turning on uh, the production of BPH excess caffeine chronic stress these all turn on sympathetics uh, interestingly though I usually throw this question in there there's actually a decreased risk there's a Belushi there uh, what's the movie Belushi's and I could ask that for extra credit question couldn't I yeah some of you got it Animal House classic Belushi there but interestingly, people who drink alcohol, not like this though, uh, but moderate alcohol use tends to decrease the chance. There's some studies that show it decreases the risk of BPH. It's thought to be st decreased stress equals decreased sympathetics. And so sympathetics. Sympathetic tone is a pretty good second runner-up runner theory, I think, on this. Or maybe the two are related together. Uh, let's see, where are we at here? Uh, dysuria and BPH so pain burning difficulty during mituration what's mituration that's urinating uh, so some of the symptoms of BPH of course not but only in about 50% of people with it but they have it's really hard they have dysuria they have trouble or burning or flat-out pain going to the bathroom and why it's thought to be secondary to the bladder's response to the prosthetic uh, urethrostenosis. And we've talked about this already. It's a beaver dam, and the bladder has to work really hard uh, to push this through. Actually, we talked about this already. So you can wreck the detrusor muscles in the bladder, and you, they can eventually, after 10, 15, 20 years, they say, forget it. We're, we're wrecked. We're not going to work anymore. And now you're in trouble because you're going to have to wear a bag to catch your urine because your bladder's done. It won't it won't push any urine out anymore. So you don't want to let this go. If you're having trouble urinating, you need to treat this because there is a chance you could wreck your bladder and have to wear the bag, and you don't want to wear the bag. What are the symptoms of BPH? Hesitancy, so it can take a really long time to urinate. We talked about that. You used to be able to just go to the bathroom, and now it takes five minutes pushing and thinking and relaxing, thinking about running water. That's not, there's something's gone wrong there. And then when you do urinate, the force and the caliber, like the thickness of the stream is not full like it used to be. It's a decreased caliber and decreased kind of wimpy stream. And then after you go, you have a sensation that I have to go pee again. It's an incomplete, and it's a correct sensation because you don't empty your bladder correctly. The, the trucer muscle is not uh, doing well, or the, the, the pipes are really, really clogged. Double emptying or voiding, so the two-hour rule. After you go to the bathroom, you shouldn't have to go to the bathroom an hour later. Uh, that means something's wrong. That's called double voiding. Straining is obvious. Straining and pushing down physically, trying to help your detrusor muscle push uh, the urine out. Uh, Poise void dribbling, and that's not, I mean, all guys dribble a little. It's impossible because of the way the uh, urethra is looped. You can't, you, all guys dribble a little bit, but this is dribbling a lot to the point where you might have to wear a pad after you urinate and then urgency you can't control normally you have an external urethral sphincter that you can close to stop the urine and you can't control it like you used to 
And you, when you got to go, you got to go, or you could have an accident in your pants. And then frequent urination, especially at nighttime. And nocturia, getting up, and that's on this test we're going to look at. How many times do you get up? You shouldn't get up at all during if you eat at if you eat at five o'clock and you go to bed at uh, ten o'clock. You probably urinate right before you go to bed, and you shouldn't have to urinate again unless you've you know been drinking beer or something like that, or had a lot of liquid with your dinner. You certainly shouldn't get up two times in the middle of the night. So that brings us to this international prostate symptom score. Uh, it's been extensively validated. Uh, its sensitivity and specificity are very high in this, so it's a great test. Uh, single most important tool uh, for evaluating patients with suspected BPH. You can give this to your patients if they're having trouble, and it's pretty good. It's no harm. They just take a test is all. And it keeps a good, it's good to get a baseline to see how the, any treatment, if they're doing some 5 alpha reductase inhibitor therapy. They measure the success of that on this uh, IPS score. So it's a good test. Let's talk about it. It's made of seven questions, and they ask the patient about their urinary habits. And you can answer zero is no problem, five is a severe problem. Highest possible score is 35. 20 to 35 is a severe problem. Eight to 19 is a moderate problem. Zero to seven is a mild problem. All right, here's the actual test. Uh, so it, it, they ask some of the questions are incomplete emptying and always over the past month. Over the past month, you can answer these questions, how you've been feeling over the past month. Incomplete emptying. So over the past month, how often have you had a sensation of not completely emptying your bladder? Like you go to the bathroom and you feel like you have to to pee again all the time and you select always five you know, whatever you whatever your problem is and then take it a step further two hour rule how often had you you had a double urinate so you go pee at 10 o'clock in the morning and you have to pee at 11 o'clock so if you pee anytime before 12 then you need to, to say how often this happens Start and stop. How about you're urinating and then all of a sudden it stops? And then you have to push again and it starts again. Start and stop. How often does that happen? Urgency. Do you have a problem with urgency? Like you, like if you have to run to the bathroom right now, are you going to urinate in your pants? Do you feel like you are? Weak stream. You get the idea. Straining. How often do you strain? Every single time you go to the bathroom, you have to strain. Or whatever. That Maybe that's not a problem with you. And then nocturia, how many times do you get up at night? Once? I mean, do you get up five times? That's crazy. But then you total those those numbers up. And what is the breakdown of people with BPH? So a huge sample of patients have been run through this with alter, ultrasound confirmed BPH. And typically, here we go. So about 20% of BPH patients end up scoring mild, 0 to 7. 57% have a moderate score, 8 to 19. 23% have a severe score, 20 to 35. Okay, that research has been around, holds true for a long time. All right, all right, so let's stop right there. I mean, we've talked about the prostate exam, but we'll talk just a tiny bit about that. We talked about it in the lab, but we'll hit it a little bit here as well. All right, see you in the next lecture.